As you see, we are starting a new collection of talks on the armor of God. So for the next number of weeks, we will be launching out of Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll be there in just a few moments, but I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn your, your scriptures there. Um, let me just give a little bit of a, kind of a little bit of a, a, a start to where we are in, in the life of the church. At this point, it's after Jesus, it's years later, Paul has been working. Uh, Paul wrote the letter of Ephesians to the church in Ephesus. And so what we're picking up here, in fact, I was reading some commentaries again this morning, and one of them calls out the fact that the book of Ephesus is probably... I would argue John, the book of the Gospel of John is probably also there, but it, the argument could be made that Ephesians is probably the most gospel-centric book in the Bible, meaning the first part of the book, the first half, so to speak, is the story of the gospel, is the message of the gospel, is the truth of what Jesus came to do, and then the last half of it is really how do we live that out. And so we are actually contemplating that later this year, like, towards the summertime as we will actually jump into a series on the whole book of Ephesians. But coming out of our last series, the series we just completed, The Chasing Carrots, and we talked about all of the different things that people pursue, this, this endless pursuit of more. And as we talked about all of these different things, what we did pretty much that whole series was talked about, this isn't what we're supposed to be chasing, rather this is what we're supposed to be chasing. And as I was planning for the year and I knew that series was coming, I wanted to put this one behind it because I believe that there is a truth at play in our world. And we're going to read about it here as we jump into Paul's. But as the, as the truth that Paul expounds onto the Ephesians is, is true and is real, there is really good news that is attached to it. So I want to make sure that we keep both of those in line. But when Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus, the church in Ephesians, what he's doing is he's laying out all these truths that he has been teaching and talking about for a long, long time. And what we're given here in Paul's writings, pretty much all of them are letters, either to a group of people or to individuals. What he typically does in his letters is he's reminding them of the things they already know. And so for us that have been around church for a long time, this will be a series about the things that we already know, but in a lot of senses, it'll be a good reminder and probably even a little bit of a challenge to us. And I don't know about you, I was teasing about the dramatic music to the, to the bumper there and everything, but I love those epic movies. You know, where you see and the camera pans and it's the whole scope of the, of the landscape. Maybe it's the mountains, maybe it's a battlefield, maybe it's the ocean, but there's this big sweeping feeling to the entire movie. And probably your favorite movie of that came to mind. I remember years ago, we got surround sound for the first time and we had just bought the extended editions of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, we're those people. And, and so I was like, oh, there's one particular, we gotta watch this. And it's this one battle scene and it's loud and it's rumbly and it's, it's cool on surround sound. Anyway, what I want us to think about is, is throughout scripture, there is actually language used of battle and of war and that the church is actually described as warriors for God. And Paul reminds us of that. And Paul has written to the Ephesians and he's getting to the end of his message, his letter, when we pick it up. And what he's going to do is he's actually going to say, now finally, my last instruction, my last reminder is what we're about to read. And we are going to read the first 20 verses of Ephesians, but we're only going to talk about a shorter bunch of them. But I wanted to read them together so you at least have that context. So let's read, and then we'll, di we'll dig into it a little bit. But Paul writes in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10 to verse 20, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that, to that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Would you pray with me one more time? Lord, we thank you for today. And Lord, I thank you that for your word and for your instructions, and Lord, for your grace that is at work in this text that we will, we will see over the next few weeks. Lord, we are humbled by the work that you are doing in the lives and the hearts of your followers. And I pray this morning that you would remind us of that. Lord, that you would not, not only remind us of, the, of that, but you would encourage us and strengthen us and stiffen our resolve. And we give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. So the whole armor of God, Paul concludes his exhortations, these instructions, this is the conclusion of his instructions. His imagery is a sustained portrayal of the Christian life as spiritual warfare using the Lord's resources. See, I don't think we actually give that a whole lot of thought when we think about our lives as followers of Christ. We tend to literally just go through the motions if we're not careful. But what Paul is reminding the church in, Ephesians, or in Ephesus about, what he's writing to them, is a reminder that our entire life is spiritual warfare. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, and I don't want to freak us out because we don't talk about things very, very often when it comes to the other side of the coin. We like to talk about Jesus and God, and the, rightfully so, but if... Friends, if there is actually a God who is for us and scripture declares that there is an enemy of our soul, then we need to understand that there is an enemy that is against us. And the scriptures actually don't spend a lot of time talking about it, but we're going to talk a little bit about it from where it does this morning. But before we jump into that, I want to walk us through just a little bit of an understanding here. And we see in verse 10, he starts with finally be strong. Now, better said, or some commentators argued that it could be translated, become strong. Not, not, now, we have be strong, and that's totally appropriate, but some, phrase, some original language believe it would be better stated to become strong, and then the rest of the sentence goes on, in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So if we think about it this way, finally, become strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. But the in the Lord statement is a, is a paraphrase of a statement that actually means in unison with the Lord. So what, it, what a beautiful picture that paints that as you and I are becoming strong, we're not doing it in our own abilities. We're not doing it in our own capabilities. In fact, there really is nothing we bring to the table. But as Paul is exhorting the church in Ephesus and to us today, his exhortation is to become strong in partnership, in unison with the Lord, and in the strength of the might, in the, in, in the strength of his might. And what that's saying, I, this first sentence is huge because it unpacks the whole thing. So become strong in unison with the Lord by the means of his strength and his might through his strength, through his might. So it's not our work. And Paul is, starts this whole talk out, this whole exhortation here at the end by explaining to the church, reminding them that we are to become strong through Christ, through our partnership with Christ, through his might. 
It is not a strength that we bring to the table. We cannot stand on our own against human powers. But through his might, which he supplies through prayer. In fact, if you look down at 618, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, to, to the end kept alert with all perseverance. We'll get there in a few weeks. But what he's saying is through the prayer to continually be reminded, to continually be asking the Lord for his strength, for his help, we're able to stand. And then verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor. Now, the, the, the whole armor actually refers to the complete equipment of a fully armed soldier. Both swords and shields. You've seen the pictures of the Roman soldier. Next week, I'll try and drop one in the slides. But you've seen that picture maybe in movies. It's the metal and it's the breastplate and it's the big, one commentator called the shield uh, a portable door because it's a big square shield they use. And then the little, one of them described the sword as the little stabby sword. You know, you see the shorter sword because they did battle like right here. But it, this whole idea of the whole armor of God is that picture. It's, it's an imagery of it. And actually in Isaiah, in multiple places, I think it's chapter 11 and chapter 54, maybe 56, I might have those wrong. But in the book of Isaiah, it actually talks about how the Lord puts on his breastplate of righteousness. So what most people are arguing is that what Paul is writing is referring to Isaiah and that we, in partnership with the Lord, are actually putting on his armor. Designed for us and equipped for us and used for this battle. And the schemes. If you... Maybe you do this, maybe you don't. If you don't, I would encourage you to do it. I would encourage you to really pay attention to the language that Scripture uses, that the people who did the hard work of translating the, the original language, the words that they choose, chose were purposeful. Because schemes indicates exactly that, that their plans, their ideas, their thoughts, that they don't always come about. Most of us are old enough to remember the, the old Roadrunner show, cartoon, with Wile E. Coyote. Meet me, anybody. <laughs> the, the coyote had a scheme for everything. And did you ever notice they never worked, except back on him? Like, you would, I remember as a kid watching this show and thinking, oh, the Roadrunner's gonna get it. And the coyote got it. So the whole idea here is I'm making a little bit of a joke to, to prove a point is that we can get so wrapped up in looking at the schemes of the enemy and getting so trapped in what looks like it's going to work that we forget who's, a, who's actually at work in our lives. In fact, in Ephesians 4, 14, a little bit earlier in his letter, Paul says this. He's talking about us not being deceived. And he says, so we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. I was thinking about this this week and it, it kind of dawned on me as I was reading this book this week and, and the, the idea of what we have seen happen in humanity from all the way back in the garden where, where God tells Adam and Eve, you can have the whole thing, you just can't eat of this one tree. Like, it dumbfounds me when people think that God withholds from us. Different sermon, but think about that. God created the world, he created two people, and he said, it's all yours except one. We get focused on what we can't have and we miss what we do have. So from all the way in the garden where the enemy shows up and he says, surely you won't die, but you'll become like God. Speaks to ego. All the way to what we see today where the plans of God, the order that God has put in place are being attacked and destroyed. There is a reason that the family is under attack in our culture today. 
Because the family is a picture of what God does in the lives of people, if you read it throughout Scripture. So it makes sense that if the family is a picture of God, if unity and, and the way the family works is a picture of how God wants to work in us, it makes sense that the enemy would try and tear that down. It also makes sense that if Scripture declares, which it does in Genesis, that you and I are created in the image of God, that the enemy would attack image, that it would attack how God has designed people. God declares early that I will make them male and female, and the enemy has attacked this. Because what he is doing is he is saying, whatever God has, there is actually something over here, but it's not better, it's counterfeit, and it is a scheme to tear down what God is working at. But he's not. So I want to do two things this morning. I want us to understand that there is an enemy and that he should be taken serious, but later I'll talk about how God is better. God's bigger than the boogeyman, as the veggie tale said. But there, we should take him seriously, but we don't give him authority. We should understand that he's at, at work and that, he's at, that he, there's an effort being made against what God has designed, but we don't give him the right to rule and to reign. In fact, the scriptures continue. Paul talks about in verse 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Here's Paul's reminder. Stop arguing with each other. Because your battle is not with the person across from you. Your battle is with what, God is, what the enemy is doing in the supernatural. There's an author, I don't think he's written much lately, haven't seen it. There's a, a Christian author named Frank Peretti, who some of his later books are a little weird, but his early books were really good. He did a, he did a series of, of three books, and one of them was called This Present Darkness. And what he's done is he's taken this idea of, of uh, uh, a character, but he's not just unpacking the story of a character, he's unpacking the supernatural story that is happening in the life of the, of the character. There's three of them. I can't remember the other two, but, but it's, a be- it's actually really well written and it's really interesting. And, and of course, I've, quote, I've mentioned it a thousand times. There's C.S. Lewis screw tape letters and it's brilliant, C.S. Lewis. But there's all of this idea that there is what we see and then there is what we don't see. And what we don't see is what Paul is pulling out and saying, you can't be poking at the people because that's not our battle. Our battle is what's going on around us. Um, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. One commentator kind of says it like this. He says, the list of spiritual rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers gives us a sobering glimpse into the devil's allies. Exceedingly powerful in their exercise of of cosmic powers over this present darkness. Catch this. And yet scripture makes clear that the enemy host is no match for the Lord who has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, triumphing over them in him. He's quoting Colossians 2 right there. So don't let this list, of, oh my, don't let that unnerve you because in Colossians, Paul reminds us that the God has disarmed the rulers and authorities. In fact, look at Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. It says this, it says, in what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? God. What is the immeasurable greatness of God's power towards us who believe? According to the work of his, God's great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Can somebody say amen? Thank you. But do you catch what Paul's saying here in Ephesians 1? He's saying that all authority is given to Jesus through God. 
that there is no one more powerful elsewhere in scripture it declares that the name of jesus is above every name and at every at the name of jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is lord so while we know there is an enemy we know who is better than the enemy But it doesn't always look like that, and I know that. I'm really well aware of that. That it doesn't always feel like it's going to work. That it doesn't always feel that God's aware. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what we have to understand is he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So Jesus was given to the church. Look at the rest of it which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. You know, here's what's interesting that you will not see through Paul's writing in Ephesians 6 in our text for the next few weeks. You will not actually see how to do something. You will just see what he, we're told to do. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. You don't actually see, well, here's what that looks like and here's how that plays out. In it. We'll talk about that over the next few weeks. But what we do know because if you read scripture with scripture in mind, what we do know is that we are called to walk together in unity, lifting one another up, confessing one to another so that we can be healed. And so what Paul is calling out here early in Ephesians is that, hey, don't forget that Jesus was given authority and he is over all to the church, which is now the fulfillment of him that are all in all. So those of us that are in Christ are with Jesus and we are the mission, we are the hands, we are the feet, we are the embodiment of God on planet earth because he chose to and I have no idea why. But it is you and it is I that go about his work, that go about coming alongside one another. Please don't hear me, or please hear me. I am not discounting the work of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is at work in you and I so that it can be worked in other people's lives. Life only works in community. Spiritual growth really only works when you do it with people. That's a few weeks from now. I want to read a quote from Wayne Gruden talking about the cosmic powers and everything. Wayne Gruden wrote a book called Systematic Theology. If you want, I was going to say boring. It's not boring. It's just not entertaining. <laughs> it's heavy for sure. It's, it's, it's a good book and it's helpful and it's about this thick. Um, but it's called Systematic Theology and it really puts to order our theology, and just so I can help because theology, the word scares people. Theo anology, it's the study of God. It's what is God? What does the Bible say about God? What is God doing? So it's, it's all it is. It's actually a really well-written book. But anyway, he says in that book, talking about the powers that be, he says, if we think the overall emphasis of the New Testament epistles, the letters in the New Testament, we realize that very little space is given to discussing demonic activity in the lives of believers or methods to resist and oppose such activity. Here's, here's why, I think. Because if Jesus has already conquered, as we sang, death, hell, and the grave, and the enemy walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, you might remember that verse from Sunday school, but it's important again to remember words as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He pretends to be a roaring lion. The cliche, his bark is bigger than his bite. Seeking whom he may devour. We know that's true, but if we also know that Jesus already conquered it, if you read the end of the book, my friends, don't get confused. We win. Let me say it better. Don't get confused. We're on the winning side because Jesus wins. You and I didn't have a whole lot to do with it. So the Bible doesn't give a whole lot of space, but Paul is pulling out the awareness and I think it's worth us being aware because especially in the day and age that we live in that everybody is ticketh offeth, that's King James for mad, at somebody, we can't get sucked into that because it's not the person that disagrees with us, it's the deceit of the enemy that has blinded their eyes. So Gruden goes on, and I won't say, read the whole thing, but he talks about this. He says, the New Testament clearly recognizes the influence of demonic activity in the world 
and even upon the lives of believers. Its primary focus regarding evangelism and Christian growth is on the choices and actions taken by the people themselves. Let me paraphrase what Gruden is talking about in a rather, rather lengthy section of his book. The Bible talks most prominently about the work of the enemy on people's lives when they are trying to be obedient to God. Because if you're not trying to live an obedient life, you're not con a concern to the enemy. You're just not. E even, even if you would claim to be a follower of Christ, but you're living a life that is contrary to the word of God, there's not really anything to worry about. Kind of like this, coaching basketball, this picture came to mind. It's kind of like, maybe you've seen basketball, maybe where there's 10 players on the court, five for each team, and it literally looks like the other team is letting one guy just kind of float out here on his own, like there's nobody playing defense on him. It's because they know that guy can't harm them. So they put the extra defense on somebody that can. It's true in our lives as well. Because if you read through Scripture, if you th see through Scripture, if you see the realities of when predominantly the enemy attacks, it's when somebody's life is trying to be obedient to what God is asking them to be. Now, let me also say, I preached a series on, or a sermon on it a long time ago. The phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle, is a lie from the pit of hell. God won't give you more than you can handle with his help but he will most likely allow more than you can handle to come into your life for one of two reasons. Either one, so you recognize your need for him as a savior, or two, so you, give, you ask forgiveness for doing things on your own power and you surrender to him again. So when the Bible brings this forth, when we see this happening, now it's not always the case, but a lot of the time it is, is it's when people are trying to live obedient lives. So he goes on to say, he says, this should be the primary focus of our efforts today when we strive to grow in holiness and faith and to overcome the sinful desires and actions that remain in our lives and to overcome the temptations that come against us from an unbelieving world. So what actually Paul is saying to the, through, to the church through Ephesians 6 is not that these weapons are to be displayed on other people. They are weapons to help us defend ourselves from the temptation of the enemy in our lives. There are ways so that we can stand firm and we can be what God needs us to be. Really quick, verse 13. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So because of what we just said, because we are partnering with God to become powerful in his might, and there are people and enemies that are not people, there are entities at war against us. Because of that, take on the whole armor of God that we may be able to, to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. The withstand there is, is the, gives the idea of successfully oppose or resist. It's standing firm. I remember growing up, I went to, I, I've talked a little bit about it, I would go to YMCA summer camp in Indiana for about eight weeks out of the summer. My mom was the camp nurse and so I would hang out at the camp all summer. Well, at some point in the camp, because I was there before camp started and I got to know the counselors and I kind of felt like I ran the place. So outside of my character, I know. But I would, try, <laughs> this is terrible. I knew I could get away with a little more because my mom worked there and everyone liked me and they knew me and all that kind of stuff. So I was, as the campground got, camp got old, longer into the summer and I had done all the activities and a little bit of boredom was setting in, I would become something of an instigator. And so, <laughs> confession time, it's church, it's healthy. I convinced some of the kids in my cabin, I'm probably 14, 15 at this point, to go try and do something to another cabin. I don't remember what it was. I really don't. I'm sure it was harmless. I promise you, I'm sure it was harmless. I'm not joking. Anyway, so they left the cabin. And as they're coming back in hot pursuit, you know, they're being pursued and people are mad and angry. Because I was a good friend, I just kind of stood with my shoulder against the door, delaying their entry. 
this is kind of the picture that we see. It's a terrible Im image for it, but it's kind of the picture that we see is that as the attacks are coming, it's us standing firm. It's using that door of a shield as to, to guard and to get behind. And we'll talk more about all that as we move on, but it's that idea of successfully withstanding. Here's what's, here's what's interesting, is Paul declares in the evil day, and there is, it's interesting, I read about three or four different commentaries, and all of them took slightly different angles, although they all unpacked the same argument. The argument here is, was Paul talking about the day they were living in, or was he just talking because it's evil? Most tend to slide to the idea that it is evil, that we are still living in the evil days because God hasn't returned yet. Jesus hasn't returned but all of this, what we need to remember through this, and we will, over the next few weeks, we will walk through the, what these elements look like in our lives. But today, what I want us to understand is that, that the importance of all of these elements hinges on the fact that we understand that we are in battle, and the battle is not against people, but it is against the enemy and his schemes. Because it is very, very naive to think if you are trying to live your life according to God's principles, that you are not going to come against opposition. And what we tend to do is when life gets a little bit difficult, we tend to blame God because it doesn't work the way we think it should. We discount the fact that it's actually working the way the Bible declares it will work. If you read the Bible, Jesus said to his disciples, they hated me. And then he goes on to say, how much more will they hate you? Friends, they killed him because they didn't like him. And he adds, how much more will they hate you? It stands to reason that there will be opposition to the truth of God. Notice I didn't say to your truth or to my truth because my truth a lot of times disagrees with this truth. You ever notice that? That when you get stepping into what you think and what you believe and then you actually read the words on the page and you don't try and apply your standards to them, that if you're honest, they typically disagree because we're human and we don't think like God does. But here's the good news. We've sort of already talked about it. The good news is this, that even though there is an enemy with a plan and with an army behind him, there is a God who's already won. I, and years ago, Krista picked on me because I, I jumped to this picture of Jesus. She didn't pick on me, but she pointed out that I jumped to this picture of Jesus. Don't get me wrong, I love the picture of the little baby in the manger whose life is before him and the redemption of the world is in his hands. I love that picture. But the one that I really enjoy is the one in Revelation where it declares that Jesus is on the back of a white horse and his robe is dipped in blood and there is fire in his eyes and he has King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh because that God, that Jesus, is not just coming to bring redemption, he is coming to restore a new heaven and a new earth and there is hope in that that you and I live in today. Because again, look at Ephesians 1. Look at Ephesians 1. The, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated at his right hand in heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. That's unbelievable above every name that is named. My mom just reminded me in an email a few days, weeks ago, I guess. At Christmas, we were together with part of my family, and one of the great nephews and I have the same middle name, Lincoln. And the middle name is actually my grandfather's uh, 
first name. So my nephew, his middle name is my grandfather's middle name. So my grandfather has three of us named after him. And so I'm sitting there, and my great-nephew is four, five, maybe. He's little. I don't know. He's about this big. Um, and I'm sitting down with him, and I pull up my Facebook page, and on my Facebook page is me at 16 with my grandfather standing in front of a vehicle that he gave me. And we're standing there, and I pulled, I pulled uh, my nephew up, and I said, hey, I want you to see something. And I, I started to try and describe who my grandfather was and why us carrying his name matters. And it was horribly pathetic. But as I was thinking about this this week, I, that, that, remind, that email came to mind. And I think for you and I, we need to remember whose name we carry. Because it's not about us. It's not about how much we know. It's not about how much we do or give. Or, it's not about any of that. It's about the fact that God exalted Jesus and Jesus created the church and then bequeathed his power on the church so that you and I are now walking in his authority, not our own authority, so that when we do step out in obedience and we expect the opposition, we're not freaked out because it's schemes and God has a better plan. But when we forget whose we are, it's easier to stop being who we're supposed to be. And so yes, clearly the enemy has a plan. But do you get why this is like, here's what's funny about it. Back to the roadrunner Wile E. Coyote. All somebody had to do was tell him, you know, this is going to fail. Like how, how not smart did the coyote have to be to not figure out, this doesn't ever seem to work out for me. The same is true of the enemy. And there is a very cliche statement, maybe you haven't heard it, it used to be in an old Christian song somewhere down the way, but it's all, it, the statement was simply this, whenever Satan reminds you of your past, you just simply remind him of his future. See, his future is determined as is yours, but the beautiful part about being in the body of Christ and being in relationship with Jesus is your past is washed away. So there is no power. There is no authority in anything Satan says or in any of his schemes. And so this morning, that is simply the reminder is that it's not just this head knowledge, idea knowledge, oh yeah, God but that we once again begin to get in our hearts whose we are. That we have been stamped, paid in full, redeemed, mine, by the creator of the universe and Jesus Christ sitting at his right hand. And so that as we go forward and we strive to be obedient, we can expect the opposition, but we know the outcome so we don't have to fear it. So here's kind of a little bit of a challenge for you. For those of us who are in Christ, go looking for it. Because here's what we do. When we, when we don't realize who we are and we don't expect the opposition and we don't go looking for the opposition, we allow that to keep us from being obedient to God. Hey, you should really talk to that person about me. Nah, they won't like it. They won't understand. They'll think I'm a, whatever excuse, whatever reason we come up with. So if you are a follower of Christ, in some ways we need to go searching for the opposition. Don't be reckless. Be obedient. <laughs> Sometimes obedience looks like recklessness. But the difference is obedience is through his power. Reckless is in our own. Now to the outside world, obedience looks like reckless. Don't get me wrong. 
So the question is, the challenge is to go looking for opposition. The question is, I guess I'm like the question better than the challenge. The question for us would be, are we experiencing opposition in our lives? And whatever the answer is, why or why not? Pray with me again.